no reason. Unless there is a cause there, that would mean you do this or else, it would be that kind of cause. You could describe, you describe the behavior. Um, pick the phone and call so and so. And if you can threaten, a person will do it. If you can say, and, and they'll, they have some news for you, that would be a way of getting you to do it and so on. Because in the past, when people have said that, you tend to do things and so on. But the, the, the mere statement of a contingency uh, may not be enough. And the fear of the, the, the contingencies cannot become causes such as the number of descriptions can't you know, say to a <laughs> don't worry. Well, that's a, that's a description of something or other. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't jive with anything that you have learned to do. Well, I'll try this one. Uh, the reason is a verbalized cause. The verbalization may do something else now. Yeah. Uh, a reason is a verbalized cause such that the subject accepts the verbalization and is aware that it is the cause. Uh, of course, the trouble here is that awareness comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's extensively that. He, 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 he then knows what will happen if. But that does not mean that he's in any disposition to do it. And that is where the, that is where the motivational side is missing in given reason. <laughs> uh, I think that Professor Boyne said that gave a key phrase before, and that is when the, when the subject is speaking about himself and he's not kidding himself. Reasons and causes would appear to be the same thing, even if he is listing and describing the causes whereby he is doing something. And if he is indeed not kidding himself, then the two things would be the same. Uh, then we spoke about, the, you mentioned the case of uh, somebody falling in love with somebody else yeah, because right. she resembled uh, <coughs> his mother. He may not be aware of it. Then the causes would be a broader set of things than the reasons he would give for his having fallen in love with. They need not claim so. So the question is whether he's kidding himself or not, whether he knows himself well, well enough or not, or not. Uh, uh, on the one hand, that's as so far as the speaker speaking about him, himself, then uh, when we induce somebody else to behave for certain reasons, the thing changes. We're giving him reasons, but that, and we're describing the contingencies he should be following, but that doesn't mean that's going to be effective. Well, don't we, ordinarily, when a person gives a reason, there's a step missing to get from that reason to what we consider to be the cause. You still have to take what the person says and do some sort of translation or something to get to the independent variables. There rarely does a person, in giving reason, state what a scientist would accept as independent variables. But is that always possible? so long as it satisfies our translation. Okay, now, do valid reasons, when you're not kidding yourself, always, are, are they always translatable into a scientific uh, analysis? Do you have a counterexample? Well, when people give purposes, when people give, explain why they do it because of wants, desires, uh, plans, thoughts. Well, we've not, we don't know for sure that all that can be translated into anything. First of all, because we don't have the complete science. And second of all, because we no one's ever done all this translation. Well, you have to review case by case. Yeah. Maybe we would run into examples which would defy translation. Yeah. Or we would it would be odd that people just intuitively know what's going to turn out to be the scientific explanation for why they behave as they do. No, but very often people do describe the, the reasons why they do mm -hmm. things simply because in the past they have been trained to observe their own behavior yeah. in relation to the uh, to causes. Why did you do it? Uh, uh, with whom did you speak? Uh, yeah. And so on and so forth. That's where the self-descriptive repertoires come in. Are, are, we, are we saying that contingency shape behavior, where no rules were involved, um, now, that behavior can also have reasons. You can extract them from the contingency. And the person, in fact, himself, after having done the behavior, can yes. give a reason, even though the behavior may have been purely contingency shaped. Yes, and so, he may continue to use a statement about the contingencies in order to keep his own behavior going. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes rule yeah. governed at that point. I use that old example of the medieval blacksmith who yeah. uh, discovers the, the bellows and the fire, and he, he himself discovers just by the contingencies that you might as well go up quickly because there's no air coming out when you're doing that, 
and you go down, don't go down too fast uh, in order to get a nice steady flow of air. So you go up like this, and then he makes a little pull up, up high, down low, up quick and down slow. That's the way to blow. But then he tells the apprentice, you know, up high, down low. Now the apprentice is only following the rules. He's doing what he's told to do. He just described. The blacksmith is doing it first of all, just because the fire glowed well when he did it this way. But then he he makes up. He describes his own behavior. Mm -hmm. And that is useful to him. Uh, in fact, this, I think this example brings up another uh, complication in this concept, doesn't it? Namely, yes, uh, the, the apprentice has this reason for working the bellows in the way that he does it. Uh, but uh, uh, it isn't because, uh, well, uh, what is the motivation of it? Uh, so, he, so, he won't be, he, uh, so he won't be equipped by his master. Yes, it's not exactly. so, it's not because, because he wants a penny a week or whatever the contract for the apprentice was, no, right? It's, it's, not, it's not because he wants a steady player. No, exactly. You see, now, now the rule is taken over entirely and is entirely in control. The blacksmith does it both ways. He probably, well, I don't know, <laughs> and so on. He, he gives himself additional assurance. It's a, it's a redundant cause, but they do it the right way. But and he may find himself getting careless and, you know, doing it the wrong way. But the assistant is only... Being, you know, this behavior is entirely governed by a description of the contingency, which is just pulled up, down, and down. He doesn't, you don't even say that, when you say that's the way to blow, you're referring to that, that produces a good fire. Mm -hmm. So that completes the statement of the contingency, the description of behavior and the consequence. But the blacksmith, I suppose many blacksmiths, before they ever, ever was verbal behavior, were doing something like that only because of the physical contingency. This, this did produce a good fire. Well, now, what would we say was the uh, apprentice's reason? I wouldn't, I would say, I wouldn't want to use reason when it's, I would simply say a certain kind of behavior has been reinforced by a steady fire, useful to the blacksmith. But I'm thinking of the, of the apprentice, not the blacksmith. The what? I'm thinking of the apprentice, not the blacksmith. Oh, the apprentice. Well, what, would be, what would you say was the apprentice's reason? Oh, but you have to give him a reason. The point is, you, you can tell him that he now knows how to flow. That isn't going to do any good. Knowing how isn't enough. You've got to give him a reason, you see. And that's, uh, and it is, it is, uh, uh, you, you sign a contract that comes in the old days and you beat the guy. If you didn't do it, that was about what you made I guess that's what Professor Quine is getting at. Why should he be doing it? In the yes, well, that, that, and, and, that beat, and that beating may never have been verbalized. That's true. So that he's, he's, oh, I don't mean to say there's anything which is not reinforced. I mean, well, it's it's no, 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 but you see, what I'm worrying about now is that here it would seem that we have something we would like to call a reason. Namely, the apprentice blows the bellows the way he does uh, so that he won't be punished. Yes, and right. that's his reason. Mm -hmm. But that never did, perhaps, get into words. No, no, I know. So, so that uh, verbalization is not a necessary condition of something being a reason. So, but what he's doing is, re is doing as directed with words. Now, imitation would have been enough. You come over and say, do, do like this, and then, you know, and, uh, no, that's not the way, do it like this, and so on. You, you wouldn't need any words at all to describe the act, because you can demonstrate. But if you're writing to somebody, you can't just demonstrate, you've got to use words, and that would be, that would then get it into words. But I always, you always have to take imitation as a special case in which you induce someone else to behave for your reason, not for his, until his reasons take over. I'm using reason the wrong way again there, of course. This is very, very confusing. You can do it. There's one other aspect of it, though. You could, every time he did it wrong, you could quip him. So that he, again, wouldn't respond to the fire. He would respond to the quip. Well, you could, of course, Avoid even imitation by shaking up his behavior. Uh, he's hungry, you have to get some food. He wanders around and finally puts his hand on the bellows and just gives him some food. And then you wait, push down again, and he's holding it a while, and then you wait, and then you wait, and then you wait, and then you wait, bigger one, and bigger one, and you eventually shake this up. You could do it in a monkey, for example, without any words at all. And that would be now just getting someone to do what you want him to do without resorting to a description of the contingencies involving bellows and fire. Well, the reason that this is important to me is that I'm very much concerned about the future of the world, as we all are, but you can 
the, you can predict future the population growth and uh, exhaustion of uh, soil. I read an awful article in, recently about America is using heavy, very heavy fertilizer now in order to feed the rest of the world where they get their important food and exhausting the soil because these fertilizers uh, reduce the fertility of the soil very rapidly. Anyway, that kind of thing. You can predict all of that and predict the hell of a future, and yet nobody has been exposed to that future, you see. So it's got to be entirely a matter of rules or descriptions of contingencies, so that if you're going to leave the lights on, you don't need to leave them on, and uh, draw a card, you don't need to go, and you have children, you don't need to have children, and so on and so on. Um, why, why, why should people follow this? Why should people follow anything like a program that will lead to a, a viable future? It's, it's, it's something nobody has ever experienced. So it cannot be due to contingencies of reinforcement. It's, it's only due to predictions upon which you base descriptions of behavior and consequences. And I think that's a very serious point, and it may very well be the, the, the root of the trouble that, that descriptions of contingencies, which are giving reasons, are not themselves enough. And the, the people in the government, religions, and, and in business who could give people reasons for not driving and not eating too much and so on, uh, don't want to do that because they have immediate contingencies which oppose that. <coughs> Well, and then most of these menaces, anyway, uh, if 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 the uh, uh, if, if one doesn't have a uh, broad kind of altruism that extends into the future, it's very well the deluge. Uh, uh, we're not going to be suffering from the depletion of the soil. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to live that long. Yes, that's that's it. Because all our all our contingencies are. Uh, are really concerned with our own in our own lifetime. Yes, and so this this uh, altruism towards uh, future generations is something that, well, of course, it's uh, a, a matter of debate to what extent it's uh, it's uh, in the genes, to what extent it's uh, uh, in uh, instilled in us by training, a uh, uh, little of both perhaps. But anyway, that's what we're depending on when we try to influence behavior by this sort of prediction. And it isn't working. That's the that's the devil of it. Uh, uh, and it, it looks to me as if the difference between behaving for real consequences and behaving in ways which have been set forth by someone um, that is, there's no additional. There's, there's nobody. There's nobody to whip the apprentice. I guess the point. Mm -hmm. uh, you can. Nobody. Nobody has yet seen the fire glow, and this is the way to do it. We know that that would be the way to, to get the fire to glow. Now, who's going to whip the apprentice and get him to behave that way? Nobody. In fact, this this contrast applies likewise, doesn't it, to uh, uh, consequences within one's own uh, uh, expected future? Um, uh, I mean, just a matter of uh, of proof. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, um, giving way to present uh, uh, appetites or uh, impulses uh, uh, in spite of the prospect of hangover or whatever. Yeah, I was curious why you didn't mention that. You say that the more remote the future, the less the chances of following advice. Yes. But you say that's mostly because uh, the more remote the consequence, the less reliable the advice is. But you don't talk about the fact that there's that delay of reinforcement. You, you don't mention that. I was curious why. Well, um, if someone predicts the weather tomorrow, I more or less begin to trust him. But if someone predicts it next month, I don't. Because, mm -hmm. and hence, uh, and because uh, that kind of prediction has never paid off for me. So that, and they're coming about uh, 10 years from now. There's no connection with my own experience. And I have to, uh, to say, oh, my trust in the predictor, but that depends upon how many times he's predicted successfully for me. And uh, I see no, I see no way of simply following advice about the future any more than people who follow advice about uh, the various things they do to into their own health. We follow advice when we, as you say, trust the advisor. 
and with remote consequences, that reliability decreases. But there's also the problem of the delay between the time I take advice and the time it pays off. And that also gets worse with remote consequences. You don't mention that. That's all I'm pointing out. Well, that's where you can get 10% time. You don't mention that. That would be visible. You know, in the consequences, in the matter of consequence, you don't talk about the labor enforcement. But in the young freedom and dignity, you do mention that substantially, several times. Oh, yes. Well, in the book, yes. I was referring to the matter of consequences. Matter of consequences. I think we're, we're trying to skirt motivation all the time in this discussion. You were just saying the problem is there's no one there to, to whip the, the apprentice. Yeah. So who would be doing the whipping now? Right. And, 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 and uh, so the question is, is giving a description of the desirable contingencies enough? Of course it's not. What's missing? Well, either someone who's in authority to whip or to motivate in some other way. Since we want to avoid the term motivation, because it breaks down into so many different things, we're back at the beginning, namely what, what are real causes among which motivation in whatever form it would be, and, and, and what is the relation of these causes and the reasons that are verbalized statements of the causes. Well, we, so, I for, think for a long time, there have been the, the three estates, and not exactly the three estates in the fourth estate was originally used, but we are, we are now living in ways which are controlled by a government of the stop and stop lights and so on and pay taxes and all of that. If we were religious, we would be following rules regarding religious behavior, and we are all economically following we, we buy things or we don't buy things, and uh, we work or we don't work, borrow and uh, loan and all of that. And those, those, of, those institutions have worked for their own futures to induce people to, to look, look ahead. Uh, Government can induce people to go to war and get shot, and the religion can reduce, induce people to become martyrs, and then the martyrs can induce people to work on the production line uh, for, for a fairly immediate future for the institution. Now, there is a fourth estate, which would be, well, we're all members of it, uh, teachers, writers, uh, thinkers in general, uh, who are not primarily concerned with getting people to behave in one way or another. We do it only by emulation, by argument, persuasion, and so on. Now, we are the only people who are not strongly controlled by these futures of government, religions, and, and industry. And we, we are therefore those who are uh, most disturbed by predictions of the future. But uh, that... Uh, that, that's his policy. If this was back season, oh, oh, I see. Um, that, uh, well, it makes us very interested in doing something about the future, and we don't have the means. And the very, the, for the very reason that we're interested in the future, if we had the means, we'd be using them for immediate consequences, and we'd be right in the same position. We'd, we'd be governors or um, priests or uh, tycoons, and uh, the. the uh, the, real, the real democratic question, I think, is whether or not those who are not tightly bound to the future of a nation or a religion or an industrial society can stir things up enough to put pressure on these people who really control the world in which we live to get them to take the future into account. And uh, I think that's a... That's, a very, very <coughs> unlikely thing to happen. Well, how did it happen to you? How, how was it that you are influenced by the future? Well, uh, I was raised in a culture which managed to survive by convincing its members that they should work for its future, I suppose. Well, we all were. Yes, well, So that's to be something special about your history or your history. And if we knew what that special thing was, maybe we could... Uh, Get more of it. Well, well, well that's what the missionary would say. Well, how can do missionary work? Uh, well, we don't know what to do, though. We don't know why some of us are concerned about the future. How did that happen? Maybe if we knew that, we'd know how to proselytize. Yes. But, of course, we may have arrived at the same state uh, in different ways. 
Uh, so maybe the thing to do is to analyze the kinds of things that may induce people okay. and then apply them individually depending on yeah. whom it is that we want to convert. Okay. I don't <laughs> well, if I may quote myself again, uh, I used to tell students who would say, why, do I, why should I care about my culture yeah. survive? And my answer was, there is no good reason, but if your culture hasn't given you one, so much the worse for the culture. But those, those organizations, whether they're clans or governments or what, that have managed to give individuals reasons for supporting them, defending them, fighting for them, dying for them, and so on, are those that are here now. And uh, the reasons they gave, let's say we're all spurious, except that they've produced the world that we see it right now. And, uh, then the question whether or not those, the, the reasons that are just cooked up uh, are in conflict with one another, so that there's no hope for anyone to take the future of the world into account, or the species. And if the species is not able, as a whole, to give the individual reasons to work for the future of the species, then it, the species won't survive. I think that's all the two pure possibilities. is continuous, in most cases, uh, with uh, ordinary, synchronic fellow feeling, kindness, not uh, uh, gratuitously kicking a dog, for instance, or, um, uh, or uh, um, taking pity on um, some stranger, um, and in, in other words, altruism, uh, and uh, it uh, uh, spreads uh, with it perhaps in decreasing force uh, outward, not only uh, spatially but temporally, and takes it in the future. And of course, uh, there are those, those uh, anti-social characters who, who make no bones about yeah. inflicting pain or a killing, all that. Um, and uh, uh, you wouldn't expect them either to think about the future. And what do we do in those cases? To the best of our ability, we impose sanctions, we, we uh, adjust the motivation in such a way that, that from a purely selfish point of view, they figure they've got more to lose than to gain by violating these rules. Uh, and similarly, regarding the future, there are going to be plenty of people who can't be brought into line except by sanctions, by passing laws uh, of a conservational kind, for instance, or, or birth control. Um, and uh, uh, so it would seem that the the, 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 the problem before us is, uh, has, has two parts. Uh, one is how we, the good guys, can uh, can uh, work out a viable set of uh, uh, sanctions, and second, how we can recruit more to our to our point of view, uh, who uh, won't need the sanctions but will be helping to uh, uh, <coughs> promote these objectives on their own. Yes, I, it, I would suggest that instead of trying to pin it on altruism, and I just don't believe that E.O. Wilson has got evidence for a gene at that level, uh, it is true uh, in the natural selection, uh, kin selection and so on, that uh, there must be some characteristic of a species that does, does lead an individual to die for the species, that is, the, that are insects where the mother lays the eggs and dies and so on and so on. That, uh, that, is, that is an innate kind of, of altruism, but rather than ask that about a cultural practice, I would ask, what, why did not kicking a dog have survival value to the group? Well, the group that, that somehow or other said that's wrong must have been stronger in some way, and it probably would be borrowed from don't kick children and don't kick other people and don't kick me particularly like that, but a, a culture which has, over the centuries, built up the behaviors we call altruistic has, has survived because of those behaviors, and that is, that's the reason for not, not a trait of altruism. So if we wanted to find out how to get more of this, we can't go out and buy any uh, altruism, we've got to change practices. And where would education come in, for example? Why would you why shouldn't schools have some very strong uh, training along the lines of not hurting animals, not hurting helpless people, and so on? It is now just the kids beat each other up in schools, and that's high honorific value. 
But I would, I would want to emphasize that the things which we, we feel are related to caring about the future are with us because they have had survival value for the cultures of which we are members. That, 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 that points, at least, to what can be done. Why is our culture failing now? Why in uh, the 60s did we fail uh, to induce a lot of people to go and get themselves killed in Vietnam? Well, a very good reason why they didn't go. And that, uh, it was a, a, a clever how many times they had sung the Star Spangled Banner before uh, baseball games and so on. That was not enough to get an awful lot of them to go when they went to Canada or something like that. And uh, the, question, the real question, of course, is whether, given a, a reasonably justifiable war, Americans would be persuaded to go compared with the Muslims who were whipping up a new fire and sword uh, holocaust for the world. <coughs> They have, they have that, of course, and are measured as fairly religious. And just today, the, the, the Sadat was killed by religious fanatics. And the religions have always done this pretty well. They've also done the other thing well. They uh, the Good Samaritan and so on, and uh, were pretty, uh, pretty important principles. Yeah, it's a uh, disturbing thought that, uh, that uh, it's not disturbing for us uh, uh, irreligious people. Uh, uh, that uh, the, that's the, uh, the the demise of religion in the West that uh, is largely the cause of the decline of the West. Yes, right. It, it gets us back to the notion of um, a socially uh, beneficial illusion. Yes, well, yes. Mm -hmm. Pie in the sky isn't too bad a thing to offer people uh, unless you have something better. And but I like to always to feel there is something better. Future becomes much more real, or becomes it becomes much more in our vision, so to speak, so that we would then begin to behave differently and take it into account. Isn't that? I mean, like World War II, I think we saw it, sort of the nationalism well, that. Well, this is too late. I mean, um, at the moment, this article I read on the food supply bothers me really because it looks terrible. You know, we were storing the vast quantities, stockpiling vast quantities of food. And then it's all gone. Now, we, sold we, we sold it to starving countries and give it away and so on and so on. And now we are intensely, we've brought, we brought land back into cultivation that we had put aside, which is a nice way of saving for the future now. And we're now just about producing enough to keep most of the world from starving, although they're going to starve for sure in Africa and, and, and India probably and so on. And we are doing, in doing this, we are exhausting yeah. our own agriculture. Um, where, where the world of food is going to come from? Even though it, it, new, new kinds of food have been invented, and uh, new fertilizers and so on, and they are absolutely taking out of, out of the earth everything which is consumable by mouth. And, but what, at what point do we stop breeding? Which is the whole problem here. That's the main thing that people have to eat. Um, with uh, 4.4, where is that chart? Uh, did you, did you, you support the Population Council and get those big charts every year, the doubling of the Mexico every 20 years and so on? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I haven't uh, studied them properly. It's such a big mail. Well, it's uh, 4.4 billion right now. And uh, going up, I, uh, I don't know, a few thousand have been born while we were talking here and so on. And, uh, these people have got to eat. Now, forget about energy, forget about anything. you have got to eat. And you can't say the jungles in South America, the jungles are not productive farmland. And it's miserable soil underneath and so on. There's got to be a certain amount of something which is converted into food. And it's, uh, the desert, deserts are sweeping, covering new areas of the world. It's a horrible picture. But when will we, when will we stop breeding? When will we stop wasting food? The, the whole Bangladesh could survive on what America throws in the garbage can every night, you know. And, uh, 
Yet we will not change our habits of eating. So it, 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 it isn't going to catch up quickly enough. Of course, the population thing is that we're still and and, uh, 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 and I think that uh, we have our our uh, reaction as a species, uh, which serves the purpose of the lemmings reaction. And uh, ours is. Uh, it's more. Ours is nuclear war at this point. Yes. And uh, the population yes, will be reduced. Hi. Uh, well, hello. How are you? Come in. Come in. No. But How I will you? hear the conclusion. Right. <laughs> Let us see. Is this Professor Klein? Uh, How do you do? We have met when you visited the Uppsala uh, uh, University. Uh, University. Uh, uh, and I think you met Dr. Bond at you. Yes. Yes. And another Dr. Bond. And this is Harry Julia. Another linguist. I'd be very... We have the chair. We have the chair for you. <laughs> so uh, we, we met when they, when they gave me that. Is that right? Exactly. I have a similar at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a welcome relief because we were just on the point of deciding that the world is doomed and it has to be done. So now come and, uh, come and cheer us up. <laughs> I think there is, uh, there is hope on in decentralization. Some parts of but the present systems as a whole will probably not survive. I see. Well, now, this, this is going to be arranged by allowing certain areas just to stay in the ocean and not come aboard the lifeboat. Is that it? Survival is very often a matter of dispersing. Mm -hmm. A light convoy is on the way between Scotland and uh, Siberia in 1943 dispersed when the situation became too complicated. I think that happens very often in history. Is there an end of the Roman Empire? Or <laughs> does it seem to disperse into, into a sort of defense side? Yes, the second perspective is possible, even if I'm no historian. <laughs> but I don't know if you speak about political or a biological survival or, or about our own survival. Well, we were talking about the world as a whole and whether or not we are running out of food, let alone energy, uh, and working straight toward uh, a nuclear holocaust when the scramble comes for what is left. Would you actually, do you actually foresee uh, something like a Pax Romana with uh, either the United States, Russia, or China? blowing the rest of the world up and carrying on by itself? Uh, is that the whole thing? I, <coughs> there is, of course, this uh, danger of uh, trend prolongation. If I say that I have a friend, John, mm -hmm. who approves uh, during a certain term to drink one more bottle of whiskey every week, let's take it that. Uh, if we just look at that trend, it proves, of course, that uh, there will come a day in a few years when he drinks a whole truck of whiskey. <laughs> and I guess the sound way to handle, and actually the sound way to handle such uh, an assumption is to take it as an reductio ad absurdum proof that this will not happen. If a trend, uh, if a trend, uh, obviously, Talks in a direction which is impossible because of other conditions. We know of. Then, uh, then it has to be ended uh, maybe uh, as a reductio ad absurdum proof that this will not happen. And uh, if you, for a moment, for discussion, say that this principle which could be made a little more precise, and uh, that, that to the nuclear uh, uh, business, you get right. So, uh, but there is, of course, a tremendous difference between having arguments for pessimism and being pessimist. Exactly like the classic between having arguments to be good and being good. Well, no, it, it, uh, it, it's true, it's a reduction right absurdum of the notion that uh, uh, population can go on increasing at this rate uh, in, uh, indefinitely into the future. But then the uh, uh, the question arises, uh, just what is going to be the form, possibly, of the uh, 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 retarding of this process, or reversal of it? Um, uh, is it going to be 
of mass destruction in the way of a nuclear war, or mass starvation, or is it going to be a, a reduction in the uh, uh, diminution of the urge to reproduce? Well, of course, the, last, the latter is the least plausible. Degradation, in the sense of going out to beach, is of course all, always the way to prevent bankruptcy. And they're always in a crisis. Uh, powers which try to prevent liquidation and to work here yeah, towards bankruptcy because liquidation is painful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it ought to be proper that more and more people realize the interest of liquidation, which is the, in this context would be disarmament. Uh, as you approach uh, the bankruptcy. But I guess the interplay between crises, in the sense of a situation which will go to bankruptcy if nothing is done, liquidation and the bankruptcy says that this is a rather subtle and complicated interplay between these three uh, things. And, uh, and there are obviously so many interests in preventing uh, the liquidation. You can see it really in an ordinary, in ordinary context, uh, political parties which were bad, the institutions which are not successful. I still don't uh, see an answer to Professor Quine's question. Uh, uh, could you, could you no. conceive of this coming about from, let us say, a, a new religion or something like that? Uh, well, one of the tenets of which would be one child per couple, uh, frugal eating, uh, stay home, don't use your cars, and, uh, and so on. Uh, if you could never cook up some reason, this is getting back to what we were talking about earlier, to get people to behave in those ways. In fact, Shakerism would do it do nicely. Shakerism, yes, Shakerism. That's another way of drawing it. It didn't contain uh, any, any seeds for it, literally seeds for its own survival. <laughs> uh, a lot of the conservation that we see is done not for the future, but because it's fashionable. Yes, it in about one year, though. Well, when is it this one year? It's this one year and something else in next. Well, something like uh, health, uh, change in diet, jogging, that's gone on for 10 years. Yes. Uh, if you could, somebody if you... came around selling non-phosphate cleaners about 10 years ago. They were talking about the, the uh, lakes all turning into phosphate or something. I, never, I haven't heard about that since. Uh, and then you'll get... Please take off. Yeah. <laughs> Jogging is, uh, I think, it is, is a remarkable phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. car, car safety. Uh, when Ford tried to sell car safety in the 50s, no one bought it. Yes. So maybe we should get Madison Avenue to make well, the conservation a, a trend and an important thing to do, a fashionable thing. Not, not because we're going to save the future, but because it's the thing to do. What, the, the what is in the 60s. The question is what's in, in it for, for them. Madison Avenue. Yeah. Well, you, you can think of product. I mean, that's what's happened. Uh, cars sell better if they have these safety features. And jogging suits, and, and, and people are spending $60 for a pair of sneakers, but they used to cost 10 <laughs> But it pays off immediately. You're a no. jogger. You, you know, it pays off every time you go jogging. Yeah. Now, for the for the, for the Fifth Avenue people, and what's in it... Well, in they the, sell products. They sell conservation But we don't products. want so many cars sold. Well, there was the good side of the hippie movement. They were they were certainly non-consumers. They wore old mm -hmm. clothes. Uh, they had to put fringe on them or something. But they certainly consumed very little as individuals during that decade. Most of what they consumed, they stole or got <laughs> from home. And that kind of thing. That was the trouble with that. But nevertheless, in all these cases, though, we, it always seems as if we have a. Um, an enemy out there that we're fighting against. I think certainly in the 60s, it was anti-establishment. They were bad people that we didn't want to grow up to be like. Yes. And I think health reasons, I think often people become uh, joggers and change their diet because they're dying. Or they've got uh, atherosclerosis so bad that they're they're expecting a heart attack at any moment. And their 
their only hope and salvation for survival is a change in those things. And it almost seems that we're not going to be able to find that, that perfect reinforcement to provide these people. What we're going to have to do is generate the enemy and, and engage in that behavior to avoid, as Will pointed out, the Russians. Maybe we should really take advantage of that and say, you know, if we stop using burning oil and driving cars and whatever, we're um, saving that to fight the Russians. And, and everyone is... Involved. Sure, that's true. Yeah. I think that, that takes us back to Gerald's uh, suggestion, namely, why do people engage in certain kinds of good movements and they last one year or two years at most, except for jogging and perhaps health food? The question is, is this a good reason? How long would that last? We, we well, want people to engage in... Yeah. It seems like, well, I don't know, I mean, that, that was a suggestion that Will brought up, and I thought it seemed like a reasonable one, because for so many years, we've talked about the threat of... If there is an enemy, it seems that that sustains the thing, but is that a good reason? Well, I know you would argue against it. You don't like the side effect of such a... Is setting up enemies a good strategy? It ought maybe to, to be mentioned as a footnote here that, uh, that these movements are marginally small, if you compare them to, to the main ambitions. Oh, yes. The main ambitions in the world, uh, Asia, Soviet Union with its colonies and so on, are of course consumers, I think. In fact, they want to consume more and more. That's one problem in the Soviet Union. Now, there is unrest because people feel they don't have enough consumer goods. So it turns out that they want to follow the pattern we want to get out of. Uh, we, we, were, we, we got a little bit away from what I thought would be the major interest in this group today, because of the Klein and Gustav. Um, could you give us some idea of your current interest as a linguist? If not, uh, we can read some of your poetry. <laughs> oh, I wish I had wrote to this poetry. Uh, uh, I, I could mention, if you want me to say something, with, uh, tell you <laughs> about something which that seems to. I have a, a philosophical training from a professor, a professor, by his doctor, many other things. And I started uh, in about um, the same age when I started my philosophical training write poetry, and I have written much more poetry than philosophy in my life, but um, for a very long time, between the age of 20 and uh, almost now, it was a problem that uh, to sort of unite these two branches. So uh, I thought it was absolutely impossible to, um, to establish any, any profound communication between these two, uh, because I I was educated in a, uh, in, a, in a period when every philosophical paper started, uh, let uh, L be a language and V be a set. <laughs> and um, in later years I have a feeling that I have managed in some way to make philosophical poems, which in some way uh, contain real thoughts and not only simulations of thought. But it has led me to... Um, think a little uh, over the problem of uh, form and content in, in philosophy. Uh, if I have understood it correctly, there are some historically given uh, forms for uh, philosophical discourse. The dialogue, um, treatise, uh, the modern essay, rather late. Is a phenomenon, and of course, it's early form, the poem. And I um, think which I uh, used to think about when I walk around is to what extent does the choice of form influence uh, the content in the philosophical text? Um, if you look at pre again. There is very little reader present, and also very little writer present. Uh, if you look at uh, the Platonic dialogues, there is much more reader present in the sense that some of this is shown to be there. I guess these different ideas uh, have, or that they open different 
space, it's full of spores. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things I would like to do next year would be to try to write, actually write a paper about the relationship between form and content in philosophy. <laughs> Maybe it is a mad idea, because of mine, I don't know. I don't know, it'll be, uh, it certainly be uh, uh, interesting to see what came out or something came out of that. Uh, I can't picture what it would be like. Obviously in the dialogue you can you can uh, uh, enter objections to your own view in an extremely fast and flexible Yes, in fact that uh, certainly uh, some situations is a is a, is a very convenient device. Um, here's a problem. Uh, there's an apparent solution to it. Yes, but then uh, there are certain bugs in that, and so uh, you you uh, have to explain uh, what the difficulties are. Uh, but then, uh, uh, on the other hand, there are two uh, aspects to that that have to be taken up. Uh, uh, and very soon, if this is done in ordinary straight prose, uh, Unless it's done very skillfully, uh, uh, the reader loses track of uh, what stage he's in in the, uh, this development. This, uh, uh, well, what uh, uh, my students probably would call a dialectic, some of them. Um, uh, but uh, uh, dialogue does it. I, uh, I had a feeling in reading uh, uh, Plato that he pushed the dialogue method far beyond uh, that particular uh, uh, utility. I mean, that. Uh, the uh, um, problems he was solving weren't, uh, that didn't involve quite the complexity that would uh, be facilitated by that device, but that would be one practical effect that you have to dialogue. I guess that the philosophical writer always is confronted with, or always has some main interest. What would be to, to express in other words, what you have said, to, to keep the line, to, to to keep under the control the main line of reason, or the main deduction. That seems to be an obvious interest. Another interest is, of course, uh, to take care of the possible objections. And a third might be to explain such details which do not immediately have to be explained in, on the main line of the school, which is taken care of by footnotes in many other forms. And, um, seems to me reasonable to say that different uh, literary forms take care of different of these interests to a different extent. And that um, looking at history of philosophy from this uh, perspective maybe, uh, maybe might be to see how the, uh, these, di at least as a minimum, to see how these different interests dominate differently in different uh, genres. I suppose in the case of poetry, uh, uh, function, one can imagine that, uh, try, try to, uh, to uh, someone trying to develop a, 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 a certain attitude that's still rather nebulous towards a, a uh, group of problems, uh, and uh, uh, sees no uh, uh, way of doing it in satisfactory, straightforward, uh, uh, analytical uh, uh, presentation. Uh, has to resort to more and more to an, uh, analogies, metaphor, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, would mean in the extreme uh, uh, writing a poem. Yeah. Then, of course, there's always the problem, the question of danger that uh, the uh, aesthetic element is going to take the place of the rational one, and uh, that, that's something that has struck me a number of times uh, in, in uh, writing something. Uh, a, 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 an amusing, pat little sort of play on words that tickles me, uh, and work it into the text. Uh, I remember this happening at least uh, once, I think more than once, in uh, writing a logic that I did more of in the old days than now. Um, and then working up, the, uh, working on the problem further and finding, no, that uh, approach uh, doesn't quite do it, uh, uh, and things going to be clear if I go out another way, I lose that place back. Uh, and it seems to me it 
the difference between science and humanities came out very clearly at that point. Keep the lights back, that's humanities. Uh, <laughs> well, now that, that is true. It's poetry that scans and rhymes. It gives you an extra reason why it is right. Uh, the fact that the rhyme is there, that is right, because it's just the thing you're expecting. Uh, does your poetry rhyme and scan, or is it just... Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say 95% of my poetry was never rhymed, but I have written a collection of sonnets. Oh, yes. Oh, and uh, this, mm -hmm. so to say, from outside in post form is interesting because it forces, as a French yes. symbolist said, it forces the thought to go into directions into which it would not have been spontaneous. If you read a lot of sonnets, you get the impression that thoughts come in a certain size. <laughs> and, um, 14 lines, and that's the end of this. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think there's a great deal in, in where, you, where things are rhymed and scanned. There's a satisfaction when you arrive there which you can mistake for agreement. And um, that's dangerous. That is dangerous. That's unfair propaganda. That's right. That's right. There uh, is some false authority in the poetical form. Rhymes and even alliteration in the yes, old Nordic right, country. Right. You think of the sonar creator or uh, where uh, No, it's just Le Mot Just for about a dozen reasons, except the one that it ought to be Le Mot Just for. I just, uh, in other words, it should be saying something, but instead it's just rhyming or scanning. Or a little isolating. Form in it. Now I have talked speaking about philosophy and I speak about poetry. Maybe I should <laughs> explain that. But form obviously can elude thoughts in, uh, in the typical uh, poetical line. I thought about uh, Egil Skalda, Grimson, Sonar, Equator, when the great Icelandic poet uh, of the 11th century has lost his, all his sounds. He makes a beautiful alliteration. This is, of course, the great art of the old Icelandic poem, to make a poem which, uh, which is not only compatible, but in terms of the way mirroring the cognitive content. And these interrelationships are very difficult to understand. You can speak about them on the level of vagueness or low precision where I have spoken now, but if you try really to attack them, for example, with some sort of uh, Analysis, I think you get into a very subtle problem. This is an extension of onomatopoeia that we've seen. Right? Yeah, I am talking about uh, about four very beautiful onomatopoeic poetic lines. I cannot write them here because there is no black board and it would take too much. Uh, well, we can move to a black No, no. <laughs> is uh, uh, Icelandic uh, poetry highly alliterative, like yes. Anglo Saxon? Yes. yes. And sometimes it is almost mechanical. But sometimes it looks as if, as if it were really a part of that which is expressed in the dance. And the lines are right in the middle, the way they did in Anglo-Saxon poetry? Yes, as a rule you have it in the middle and at the end. But it can be, uh, it can be uh, braided in rather different ways. Um, of course, these could take us to an, uh, another very interesting of them, namely what is, uh, what, is, uh, for, what, what is a thought in poetry. The poet trans, uh, if you permit me to speak a little longer, uh, the poet trans German starts, a uh, contemporary of mine, uh, starts a rather famous poem with the following line. <clears throat> December, Sweden is an uh, unreached beach sheet. And that is considered to be a uh, loveable metaphor if you have seen Sweden in November. It looks like New England. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, every idiot sees that it is a force. A sentence expressing a force proposition because Sweden is a country. But on the other hand, if you substitute for this uh, December, Sweden is a green flowering god. Uh, you would not have been willing to accept that in the way in which you accept this time. So the question is, what is that which you accept when you accept transform time as, what shall we say, more a different or uh, than uh, the suggestion that I would like. We are not dealing with, uh, with anything in free against categories, that's for sure. Can't be explained, as far as I understand, can't be explained extension.
president. Uh, but um, what is the authority of the poor? What makes us accept the dying support? Make that poor? So would you say then that the poetry has advantages in expressing thoughts or dangers? Or it is Sometimes it can be tremendously sharp and it takes the instruments. Uh, there are lines which have explained the historical situation. I cannot give you a brilliant example immediately, but I am certain that you would find it if you start looking into, into your own anthologies. Maybe the answer, Fred, to your question about, about what the, how to motivate people to work for the future is, is to uh, do so by means of poetry. Well, I was thinking about that. We really, we, uh, and and uh, Van said earlier that we might have to accept the fact that uh, non-religious people, that uh, the decline of the West has been a decline of religion, that, we, that uh, poetry might be the substitute here. But if we could make all our uh, propositions highly palatable for any reason at all, so long as they were palatable, uh, poetry would help on that. Uh, we'd be better off. Maybe any age can be given a function, after all. <laughs> yes. How do you bring people around to reading poetry? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Advertising, it's great. No, they don't even teach them poetry Music anymore songs. in the schools. They don't mean the American. By making very good poetry, which is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. More than that. Yeah. Well, people who read poetry are in the minority, definitely. I don't want to impose my wishes here too strongly. Would you? Would you be interested in reading, a, just reciting a few lines of one of your poems so that we can see what it sounds like in Swedish, just for the, okay. just for the, the vocal music of it? I must look into my memory to see if I can find something beautiful. But I read it from my, no, my 27 volume. Jag har väl inget namn, men kallas sorg. En knuten näve är en bräcklig korg av spröda finkvi. Att rätt förstå och få förstå att bära det. Du står på något första av Adolfs torg och ser dig övergiven. Att övergå en sådan kant är svårt. En fågelby där ingen fågel bor ger lätt ett intryck av förvirring. Men vilken rätt förrättar den som vet att bryta upp från alla band? I think I don't get used to that. Har du sett att en bird på en meadow kommer till det? Ja. Jag tror att jag kan ta ordet. Ja, jag sa att... A fist like this, a clenched fist, is a fragile cage for a bird where no bird is ever lived. That is what I say in that time. What are your wishes? What should we uh, pursue? I can 
be more such uh, forces which we cannot overlook. And um, maybe that is a reason for hope or a reason for confidence. Yes. 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 But, uh, but uh, there may be uh, one or two to remember this because, uh, because it is very characteristic when you look at different historical kinds in the past. What, what could it have been in the Muslim culture that leads to a, a wild, fanatical, religious activity. Certainly it isn't simply a hope of heaven, that kind of thing there. It must be something here and now. This is, this is uh, the thing that I will be admired for doing or just joining up and finding yourself more powerful because you're doing what someone else is doing along with you. There's that, uh, that was the old lynching mob, a single man who wouldn't be brave enough to, to do this, but to get a hundred men together all shouting and screaming and so on. Each one of them gets some marvelous feedback from, from power. I suppose that's part of those crowds in uh, Iran shaking their fist at the camera and so on, and you're doing what 100,000 people are doing, and so the camera men must be scared of you. Uh, but I, it would be very hard to analyze. I don't think anyone would properly analyze religious hysteria. I don't mean the kind of religious states that William James analyzed, but the kind of thing that could have led Mohammed and then the people who followed him across North Africa and up into Spain uh, with fire and sword. I mean, that was, that was a way of life. And half of them died, of course, on the way, and a couple more than half. And so... Uh, yes, well, if we knew how to induce a worldwide hysteria, the uh, religious kind, that made for some of us, it would have to be a nice solution. <laughs> yes. Yes, a uh, repugnance at the thought of your image. Oh. Well, well there's a thing of two, two uh, uh, manifestations in our society now. One, resurgence of religion. There are the Jesus freaks, for one thing, and then, um, and, uh, in fact, we don't think of as religion in any uh, traditional sense, the uh, uh, parascientific stuff, the uh, uh, occultism, oh, yes. uh, and uh, uh, witchcraft. And then, uh, maybe in this matter of celibacy, uh, the uh, sudden uh, uh, unprecedented in our Western culture, uh, uh, tolerance of homosexuality, yes. all this business yes. of gay rights. Yes. Um, well. Um, that yes, that certainly is a step in the right direction when it comes to the population, population. problem. Um, and uh, it it would be uh, it it'd be interesting to know what the what the mechanisms are behind these uh, movements. S similarly, the uh, mechanism behind the sudden increase in uh, uh, fertility or fecundity of a population after uh, a plague or a war. Yeah. And just how does that work in the individual, um, which is, who's, of course, one room, room, room is, is there's room, there's room, room for them after a plague. There are empty houses around, and uh, the farmland hasn't been taken over by somebody else. You can, you can have a big family after a plague because the, the, the population is decimated. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, these are strange question for us to be discussing ourselves to, it seems to me. I think it just makes you realize how powerless you are to do the things that you see there is we know what should be done. That's that's the thing, you see. We we could write a scenario to use a horrible word, which would reduce population, consume uh, less, save things. Uh, the only thing is to bring it about. And, uh, and we haven't got, got, the, got the handle 
Okay. Yeah, similarly for disarmament. We know exactly what should be done, what right. should be done. Right. What should be done on both sides, of course. That's right. I think it's quite, uh, quite precise in a way, I guess. Uh, it's nothing simpler, uh, simpler than to say what we want with nuclear weapons. We just want them all destroyed. That's mm -hmm. that. And that would be all feel a lot safer if they were gone, certainly. But not safe enough to overcome fears and uh, negotiate properly in that direction. And there uh, again, it's a question of being able to specify consequences without arranging for reason for, for causes for the reason. And uh, switching back to what you were talking about um, earlier, um, I tried to think of, uh, of of a case where a philosophically significant thought uh, did uh, occur in poetry uh, in such a way that it might be just as well have been done in prose as far as conveying the thought is concerned. Can you think of the case? No, in the pre-Socratic. I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess the clever student answers with that means, but uh, aren't there other cases in the Renaissance? Uh, well, no, for, for instance, I, I, I think uh, uh, Lucretius was great stuff, philosophically, yeah. and it was poetry, but uh, uh, that, uh, insofar as it's great stuff, philosophically, I think that could all have been done in straight del prose. I'm just wondering what, uh, about a case where poetry actually uh, uh, added to the thought. Uh, I, I should maybe not defend such a strong thesis as that there are thoughts which can only be expressed in one form. But, uh, but uh, the slightly weaker thesis that, um, that it will affect the development of a thought in what way it is expressed, which is maybe that is a much weaker, because it is hard to find an example of something which could not be said in some other. Uh, genre. But, uh, for example, the order of presentation would be very different. I have an idea about Heraclitus fragments. Uh, now there are, as you know, some people who try to reconstruct Heraclitus' book, and who speak almost as if it uh, did exist. Uh, there is a guy in Canada, Khan, who is just a uh, And I don't think that he has ever been such a thing as Heraclitus' book. No, there was some, what he was, was it some name earlier to an American that was doing as far as a, I was. Oh. Yeah, that's a later one that I don't know about. Anyway, that, uh, um, whoever this man was, uh, uh, I, I was amazed at the size of the book that he was attributing. <laughs> Maybe he's after me. Uh, it makes me think of those uh, reconstructions of, by Sir Arthur, uh, uh, what's his name at uh, Knossos, uh, um, Heaven. Yes. Right. Uh, the, uh, it, it must be said in their behalf that they did put in a distinctive color the part that was really uh, found, and the rest of it is filling in by conjecture. But the elaborate uh, uh, fanciful scenes that are filled in uh, in the uh, uh, conjectural mode on the basis of just a little corner of uh, yes. something, um, and that's certainly what's been done to her by this. It seems to me that a dialogue, as we mentioned, is, is the convenience because characters can represent themes or ideas. Yes. Now, you don't need to get them confused. When such and such a position is being talked about, so and so, Hylas or Phila News or someone like that says that. So you, it's very convenient and, and it's talking back and forth. But poetry adds, in addition to that, some inducement to, to say yeah. things. And ambiguity, which is not wished for in philosophy, but, um, but of course can again help, help thought in some Yes. Even if it is not acceptable to work I suppose one of the reasons that they used to have little, uh, little poems for children on how to behave, they were poems, or you can get them to recite them as poetry, and uh, sub subliminally you were sneaking in a little mottos or prescriptions or proverbs or rules of conduct. Scruple paper. Yeah. No, that's true. It can remain at the verbal level, so satisfied with how it sounds, and it still has nothing to do with your non-verbal behavior. 
the Turden may, uh, I, I don't know why, I don't know why I say Turden may, but I assume that the old troubadour Homer and so on were scanning and so on and so on because they had to memorize this memorize, stuff. Yes, they were right. telling a story, but uh, by, by putting it in a memorizable form, they didn't leave an episode out and so on, that kind of thing. It, 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 it was certainly serving a function in helping them produce what they were saying. People sitting around and you start to talk, and not only is it pleasing to listen to when it's just form, it's very easy to remember and recite. You distinguish for uh, between the humanities and the sciences as to whether or not one, one went with the aesthetically pleasing or uh, came out the way rationality seemed to dictate. Um, but you're not saying that that the rational consideration dictate one conclusion. Uh, or are you? Or, there must be other factors that come in that might not be called aesthetic, but they're also more logically, logical deduction. Well, uh, yes. Uh, clarity of exposition, mm -hmm. uh, of persuasion, which might, uh, which would put it, uh, which could put a premium on the poetic thing. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, one, one likes to have the best of both worlds, and it's very nice if uh, one can keep that wisecrack and mm -hmm. still have uh, uh, the, the idea. But uh, it's, it's just the particular case where the two <coughs> come into this confrontation, and uh, uh, one of them has to give way. What about the position itself, other than the expression? The position, your, your conclusion after thinking through a position. I'm sure you consider many alternatives, and you end up with one, and um, isn't it sometimes the case that you could almost have come up with a different conclusion? Um, and what dictates the final decision um, is not purely uh, not purely logic. Uh, well, not what would it be, Debbie Gray? Uh, uh, the one factor it would be, what did I manage to think of? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that puts a premium on continuity with my previous ideas, previous things I've, uh, I've read in the past and all that. Uh, uh, simply the, the poverty of imagination. Uh, so that, that, that poses a limitation. And there might be with uh, more freedom of imagination a better, a better solution. But then within that limited scope, then another uh, factor certainly is, is simplicity, naturalness, pure or briefer uh, assumptions. Um, <coughs> um, neither not having to provide for some exceptions in, a, in an ad hoc way, uh, and this would th these would have been the sorts of uh, considerations that finally would uh, lead me reluctantly to give up some such verbal conceit. Do you do you ever think of yourself as having some worldview that you? hope your argument lead to, and uh, is that, does that guide uh, the conclusions you come to in any way? Well, yes, uh, but uh, that's the goal, this worldview, partly, uh, uh, and <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the premium. Uh, to put a premium on uh, on uh, uh, hypotheses that fit this preconception, but of course but both ends are being played one against the other, and you you got something that looks like a pretty good hypothesis and doesn't fit that preconception, then you begin to to uh, question that worldview and maybe make some changes in it. <laughs> I think this is uh, I mean this is a characteristic of scientific efforts generally, I should think. <laughs> Would the specific kind of leadership you have in mind be uh, a priority in your choosing to deal, uh, to select one way of going about exposing problems uh, in standstill? Yes, very much so. That's a factor. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, clarity of uh, exposition also. Uh, Another way in which the readership that one has in mind would operate is you'd be thinking what uh, 
what, what sorts of objections, criticisms, was we've been, been getting? What are the um, what are the misguided notions that have been getting in the way of putting your ideas across? And you'd be uh, 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 emphasizing uh, points that bore directly on that in the most telling way. Uh, and uh, in fact, this is an experience I think we all uh, have. Um, um, that means emphasizing certain things. Uh, uh, further uh, details have to uh, come in, or further aspects have to come into the overall exposition, but uh, uh, they come in uh, more briefly and sketchily because you can't uh, say everything at once. Uh, and uh, those are the places where then you're picked up later the uh, points that weren't the points at issue, that weren't the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the action we're going to. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, you turn, your, you, you, you turn to those and uh, uh, do a more explicit, rigorous job, uh, less metaphorical. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, that... Uh, that Effects upon the reader would have been yes. uh, wrong criteria. That's right. Uh, if we take the whole effect on the reader, that is the whole, uh, whole ultimate criteria, right. I think. <laughs> Since one of the effects to uh, want is to have the reader uh, see the... Uh, the matter. Come around to the point of view. But, you know, yes, but not, not only that. Also, you, you find a way of being perfectly persuasive, but it isn't quite true. It isn't that if you decide that this isn't quite the, the way the world is. This isn't quite uh, it. Uh, you have to modify it a bit. Maybe this is where the wisecrack had to go by the board. Uh, uh, either before or after, it might have been equally persuasive on the reader. In fact, from better first. Uh, uh, Previously, but when you still had this uh, bit of rhetoric in it, but you also, but one of the effects that you want to have in the reader is uh, making him see the light and the truth as one sees it himself at that point. Another thing, other advantage as a poet, I was trying to think of what you gain from being a poet. Um, we all, I think, have the impression that. Ideas just come from nowhere, and uh, that led to the old uh, divine of Plato's uh, idea that somebody was talking through you, with your muse was operating, and uh, one learns to put oneself in a state of, uh, of of openness, waiting waiting for things to come and strike, and uh, it's possible that the poet, more often than any other learns how to become receptive to, I'm, it's coming from inside, I know, but I think of it as coming from outside, and uh, you're, if you're waiting for a rhyme or a, a scanning word and so on, it's possible that you become very skillful in lowering your verbal threshold so that all available responses have had a chance here. And that would increase a lot of the sheer random variation which you go down in the creative process. You've got to have some variation to select, to create the work. And uh, if you can maximize the frequency of which lightning strikes you, uh, you, you may have a considerable advantage. And uh, I suspect that uh, a serious effort to write poetry would and put you in a very helpful mood or state for the receiving of ideas uh, in general. Uh, there is, a, there is a, I think, topological concept which uh, the Germans call Freiheitsgrad. I do not know what you call it in English. A degree of freedom. Things can be yes, uh, 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 deformed uh, under different... Uh, yeah, that's what I was really talking about. I'm inclined to say that if you compare the, the work philosopher working in a modern form of philosophical essay and the poet, there is obviously one Freiheitsgrad, more important. You are permitted to combine things which are never combined otherwise. And I, I like very much your idea of, uh, of uh, poetry almost as a randomizer. The ambitions for the poetry seem to be almost uh, contradictory. The philosopher, the serious philosopher has to keep down uh, the sudden impasse. Uh, Dr. Julia and I know a man who can speak 100 random numbers. Fantastic. Uh, uh, <laughs> as, as, as evaluated by a computer. This is uh, Chap Nur L. Nuringer. 
he can he can give out a hundred numbers and they will be appraised by a computer as random. Now, to do that, he has had to destroy all of what I call the interverbals, the, the one, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight, and the telephone numbers. He's got he somehow or other he's able to wipe that all out. Crazy. So that after he says five, he is equally likely to say any other any other number. No, how quickly does he do it? Hmm? How quickly does he say the hundred numbers? Uh, did you see him do it? Uh, did no, I didn't see him. No, uh, but he says he does it, but he's basing a whole theory of behavior on it. It's, 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 it's disgusting. However, <laughs> he can't do it. Now, this, this is, is one of these states of right eye surgeon. He's absolutely, absolutely treated for any number to come to him. This uh, willingness to combine, which is not actually combine, is to my experience the uh, characteristic to the, uh, to the poetic uh, mm. procedure, to the creation process. <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, may I add a little remark to what was said here about, um, yes, Mr. Klein said that sometimes he has a beautiful formulation and with regret sees that he has to give it up because it is not the adequate formulation. But this also happens in poetic mm. work. Uh, how often does it happen that you see that this line is much too beautiful? Uh, the German poet Hans Magnus Ensenfeyer once said very wisely that long poems, really long poems, cannot contain too many good lines because they become enormously tiring. They yeah. have to have some, uh, maybe not bad, but uh, a yeah. great account. I think I have often sacrificed beauty for a deepest in poetry, too. And this, uh, of course, leads us to the question, what is uh, aesthetic in a mathematical proof? There is, of course, an aesthetic of the surface and uh, a sort of profound, uh, what to call it, a deep, a beauty of a deep structure and beauty of the surface. Um, Everybody who has studied a little mathematics has met these teachers who make uh, things which are very elegant of the surface, you know, such a high cosmopistic attitude, uh, and which uh, do not have this uh, distinction between the ornamental beauty and the profound beauty, which I think it won't be. Yes, well, the economy of means, along with profundity of oh. content, certainly. Mm -hmm. That, that's very taxing on the reader. Then. So mm. the same criterion we were coming up with before, namely the effect upon the uh, upon the listener or your reader, would come into into poetry as well. Uh, sometimes you would choose not to have too compact and dense a set of beautiful thoughts because the reader would get too tired, to, like get confused or whatever. So then you again it's effect upon the reader, yeah. and, and and that is ultimately the, the Selecting consequence. Well, it's depressing to think of a poet that uh, gets too many beautiful lines and so he deliberately spoils some. So it's the reason. We better make a longer, longer poem and put some dull lines in between to keep everything. <laughs> Turn them over to somebody else and write a few extra lines and I'm good quality. If we were asking how do we get people around to reading more poetry, maybe that would have to be one way to program them. I can tell you exactly what happens if you don't cut down two beautiful lines. You get academies, you get uh, uh, art de salon, you get exactly that which 20 years later looks like academic art. Mm -hmm. uh, clever in the, in the sense of well adapted to a certain So obvious. It's very important not to be charming or clever. Especially if you're trying to no. make philosophical thought, which is what Professor Glenn was saying, the danger is then is that aesthetics take over. I think somebody wanted a little more um, detailed discussion of these problems could, of course, look at Lewis Cairon and ask uh, what is the uh, uh, interaction between uh, Lewis Cairon's poetry and the philosophers uh, after Lewis Cairon. You would probably I speak about the political Louis Cairo, not about uh, the Lord. This famous Cheshire cat, which disappears and leaves its smile. <laughs> it is remarkable how, how 
How, how often Lewis Carroll is quoted by philosophers? Yes. 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 Everybody else, too. It's good to have a line at the beginning of every chapter. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how good was, uh, was he as a logician? I mean, he plays with all sorts of tricky Oh, no, not, not much good. That, that was pretty trivial stuff, even, yes. even in, in his day. W.W. Yes. Uh, Bartley III, uh, 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 who de didn't really know enough for uh, uh, logic himself, uh, I gave, gave the wrong picture in uh, making Lewis Carroll out such a pioneer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, uh, I, the, you know, there, there's that big posthumous uh, Lewis Carroll symbolic logic, uh, where it's called mm -hmm. the find, finding uh, the proofs, partly proofs, partly manuscripts, of a volume two of Lewis Carroll's symbolic logic, that his little volume one has been known, which is really quite trivial, slight stuff that's written be not intelligible to children. Um, and Bartley uh, then brought up this book with, the, with both volumes in it and a lot of additional stuff added out and a long uh, introduction by, by himself. And uh, I reviewed that for, uh, I guess it was T T L either TLS or Times, New York, I guess TLS. TLS, I think. And so, uh, in the course of that, I, I went through it and had, had, came to it. Uh, pretty definite uh, uh, evaluation, and uh, there's, I, I don't think there's anything that could be pointed to that was a uh, uh, theoretical contribution to logic no. of any consequence in the zero. No. And he didn't know the things that had been happening at the, outside of England at the time, and nothing had been happening inside England, probably. <laughs> John Venn. But C.S. Burris, Frege, Payano. Um, Were they both Italians? Frege and uh, Payano? No, Frege is German. Oh, well, of course, of course. Right. And Payano and uh, uh, Ernst uh, Schroeder. Yeah. He, he could have had the benefit of all these. Those mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he's uh, being exposed now for his uh, other stuff, too, his interesting little girl. Mm -hmm. Photographing them in the nude, both of their parents considerably. Yes. Yeah. I unfortunately have got to go over and keep an appointment with the health service, and I can't believe I don't want to break this up at the office. Well, I ought to be long. I've been laid up with a cold. I'm just oh. getting over it, so I can well. It has been a great pleasure. Well, it's been delightful to have you here. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah. That's how it Do you meet very often? It's the first time for me. Well, we meet, uh, uh, yes, we...